Indian Springs records indicate that Global was overdrawn at the bank by an average of $150,000 a day. When Global filed for bankruptcy in late 1983, it listed $15 million in debts to unsecured creditors, including about $280,000 to Indian Springs. The bank, located in a strip shopping center, had about $27 million in deposits when it failed in January of 1984. Azimas, Azimas Global, quote, certainly did contribute to the failure of Indian Springs State Bank, said Michael Manning, a Kansas City lawyer hired by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation to investigate the bank's failure. Federal law enforcement sources told the Post that the Criminal Intelligence Division of the IRS investigated Azima in connection with the bank's failure. Sources said the IRS referred the evidence it gathered to the Justice Department's organized crime strike force, which in turn asked the FBI to look into the matter. According to one source in the case, the FBI did not investigate it because did not investigate because it was told by the CIA that Azima was quote off limits unquote. That last sentence again. According to one source in the case, the FBI did not investigate because it was told by the CIA that Azima was quote off limits unquote. Again, quoting, I was told by the FBI that Azima had a get out of jail free card unquote. A source involved in the investigation said. On Sunday, the Post reported that evidence related to the nation's savings and loan crisis suggested a possible link between the CIA and organized crime and the failure of 22 SNLs. Indian Springs is a bank and was not included on the list. But the Post found evidence linking Azima and another key figure in the bank's collapse to failed SNLs. The other was Mario Renda, R-E-N-D-A, a Long Island money broker now serving a federal prison sentence for racketeering and bank fraud. Renda is one of the major figures in this country's savings and loan fraud crisis. He brokered billions of dollars of deposits into SNLs that later failed, including mainland savings in Houston. In many cases, these deposits were tied to loans made to Renda's associates, loans which later went bad and contributed to the failure of the thrifts. Indian Springs is the first place Renda was caught in the scam. He brokered $6 million in deposits into Indian Springs in exchange for loans to his associates. Renda later avoided most banks and concentrated on SNLs. Renda has ties to the Gambino and Luc Lucchese Mafia crime families in New York. He also has connections to Adnan Khashoggi, the Saudi Arabian middleman and arms dealer who was involved in the Iran-Contra affair. Uh, I would interrupt the article. Uh, bear in mind that elements of the Gambino crime family intersect very heavily with the P2 milieu that we took a look at in Radio Free America shows 17 through 21 about the Pope shooting and that we came back to in a vengeance in Radio Free America shows 32, 34, and various addenda to 34, including and especially the Shikarki AG case. And again, check the archives for those. Resuming again with the Houston Post article of February 8th of 1990, let me reread that last paragraph. Of Mario Renda, Pete Bruton writes, Renda has ties to the Gambino and Lucchese Mafia crime families in New York. He also has connections to Adnan Khashoggi, the Saudi Arabian middleman and arms dealer who was involved in the Iran-Contra affair. It was another reputed organized crime figure, Anthony Russo, who arranged for Renda to, to do business with Indian Springs. Russo, a Kansas City lawyer who voluntarily surrendered his license after his 1974 conviction for conspiracy to promote bribery and prostitution, was employed by the, the, by the bank to bring customers to Indian Springs. Many of these were members of the Kansas City Mafia crime family and other organized crime figures. It was also Russo, a global consultant and advisory director, who brought Azima and Global to Indian Springs. That last sentence again. It was also Russo, a global consultant and advisory director, who brought Azima and Global to Indian Springs. Manning said losses on loans to real estate, limited partnerships in Hawaii, which were tied to Renda's brokered deposits, totaled close to $5 million. Renda was later convicted for his part in this scheme. Russo and Azima were sued together in their roles as bank officers and directors for fraud and negligence involving the bank's failure. The lawsuit was settled out of court by their insurance company. Russo was tried twice for income tax fraud, partly in connection with his role in the failure of Indian Springs, but both trials ended in hung juries. Azima was never charged criminally in connection with the bank's failure. Federal investigators differ on how closely Global, whose letterhead read GIA, was tied to the CIA. Some say it was a CIA proprietary or owned by the CIA. 
Others say it just performed work for the CIA on a contract basis. Skipping down in the article, several sources who know Farhad Azima said he had close ties to the Republican administration. Frank Van Geyso, V-A-N, capital G-E-Y-S-O, a pilot who flew 707s for Global for four years, told the Post, quote, Anytime we had a little problem with the feds, Azima would jump on a plane to Washington and straighten it out. The feds, the Federal Aviation Administration, would be mad as hell, but there was nothing they could do. Azima told the Post that he, quote, doesn't recall attending any White House functions and denied having any pull or connections or clout there. I am just a small businessman, he said. Azima refused to say how much money he has contributed to Republican coffers. That is not information I prefer to discuss. I would not say it is a lot, he said. Federal Election Commission records show that from 1983 through 1988, Azima contributed $54,196 to Republican campaigns and $15,500 to Democratic candidates. These records show that Azima's first campaign contribution was made in October of 1983, three days before a global fire filed for bankruptcy. From 1984 to 1986, Azima contributed $27,000 to the President's Dinner Committee, which was also called the Republican Senate House Dinner Committee. His 1986 contribution to this committee, $9,000, was made on May 8, according to FEC records. Gary Koops, a spokesman for the National Republican Congressional Committee, said the dinner put on by his organization and the National Republican Senatorial Committee is, quote, an annual event in which the President speaks. I'm sure that President Reagan attended the 1986 event. Probably at that time, Vice President Bush attended also. It's a fairly large event, one of our major land, one of our major fundraising events of the year. Those invited are people that have long supported the Republican Party or, for that case, President Reagan, major donors, or people like that, Coop said. When asked when and where the 1986 event took place and whether Azima attended, Coop said he would research the question and get back to the post. He said he had not responded. Uh, he said, let me, re- let me begin again. When asked when and where the 1986 event took place and whether Azima attended, Coop said he would research the questions and get back to the post. He had not responded as of Wednesday night. Several weeks after Azima reportedly visited the White House, a Boeing 707 owned by Race Aviation was used to ship 23 tons of arms, including tow missiles, to Iran as part of a secret arms for hostages deal. A number of publications identified Race as being owned by Azima and his wife. Now, this is one of the important connections here. I'm going to repeat this, the Race-Azima global connection. Several weeks after Azima reportedly visited the White House, a Boeing 707 owned by Race Aviation was used to ship 23 tons of arms, including tow missiles, to Iran as part of a secret arms for hostages deal. A number of publications identified Race as being owned by Azima and his wife. Azima told the Post he neither owned Race nor had anything to do with it. In the same interview, he later said that his brother owns it. Farhad hides behind his brother a lot, quote, one investigator told the Post. Next sentence, very important. Global's bankruptcy papers show a $400 payment on March 15, 1985, from Race Aviation to Global for office rent. Now, of course, that's a small amount of money, but the very fact that they're related here is significant. Continuing with the the Houston Post article, Azima said neither he nor any of his companies ever shipped arms to Iran or to the Contras. He said he had been interviewed by the FBI and congressional investigators about the Iran-Contra affair and had been, quote, cleared, unquote. Azima also denied knowing former White House aide Oliver North. But when he was asked if he knew the late William Casey, the CIA director during the Reagan administration, he replied, quote, he is dead. It's academic, unquote. He refused to say if he was denying that he knew Casey, replying, next case, unquote. Global hauled arms and military equipment all over the world for private companies and governments. Its biggest client was the Egyptian American Transport and Services Corporation, Itzco, a company controlled by ex-CIA agents, including the renegade agent Edwin Wilson, now serving time for selling explosives to Libya. Wilson was tried and convicted in Houston. Also involved in Itzco, which shipped military equipment to Egypt, were ex-CIA agents Thomas Kleins and Theodore Shackley, who were involved in some of the Iran-Contra dealings, and retired Air Force Major General Richard Secord, one of the leaders of the Contra resupply effort. Azima refused to answer questions about Itzco. 
Gene Wheaton, a former Pentagon criminal investigator, told the Post that Global was the, quote, aviation arm of Eatsco. They owned it through cutouts, third parties, unquote. Repeating that last sentence, Gene Wheaton, a former Pentagon criminal investigator, told the Post that Global was, quote, the aviation arm of Eatsco. They owned it through cutouts, third parties, unquote. A private investigator in Houston who has looked into Global and Eatsco agreed, quote, Wilson, Kleins, and Secord incorporated Global, the investigator said. A possible connection between Global and the CIA involves an ex-CIA contract agent and pilot, Heinrich Rupp. Rupp was sentenced to, t- sentenced to two years in prison for a scheme involving alleged mob associate John Napoli to defraud a Colorado bank. An ID card with Rupp's bank and with Rupp's name and picture on it, dated November 1st, 1975, shows Rupp to be a vice president and pilot for Global International Airlines out of Dallas. The Texas Secretary of State's office has no record of any Global International Airlines incorporated in Texas. Azima's company was not Global International Air was Azima's company was Global International Airways, not airlines. But several sources close to Rupp said the two Globals are the same. Azima denied knowing Rupp and denied that Rupp had any connection to his company. In their new book, Inside Job, The Looting of America's Savings and Loans, co-authors Steve Pizzo, Mary Fricker, and Paul Muolo write that, quote, Global International developed a reputation among insiders as one of the CIA's secret charter airlines, unquote. They note that some former pilots with Air America, a CIA air proprietary, showed up on Global's pilot rosters. Several of Global's creditors listed in his bankruptcy case had connections to the CIA and the Contras, prompting a former intelligence agent and arms dealer to laugh and remark, quote, how can they owe themselves money, unquote. One Global creditor, Southern Air Transport in Miami, was a former CIA proprietary that was later sold to James Bastian, an ex-CIA lawyer. Southern Air Transport provided planes for the shipment of arms to Iran and to the Contras. Azima said he doesn't recall, quote-unquote, any work that Southern Air Transport did for Global. But Van Geizo, the former Global pilot, said Southern Air did maintenance work on Global's planes when they were in Miami. Van Geizo said he would make hauls from Miami to Chile, Peru, and Colombia with cargo that included cars, computers, refrigerators, and televisions. On one return trip from Bogota, Colombia, he brought back illegal drugs. A former FBI agent who had investigated Azima said he had heard about global planes flying guns to different places and then come back with, then coming back with drugs. Azima denied any knowledge of global aircraft carrying drugs. A big global customer was the U.S. Department of Defense, which owed Global $100,000 according to its bankruptcy filings. However, Global owed the Department, however, Global owed the Department of Defense $367,000 according to bankruptcy records. The article goes on for a while. Uh, one of the interesting things, I'm not going to go into it in any detail, but uh, Morris Schenker, a late organized crime ma- lawyer, has also been linked to Global and uh, some of the operations of Global. These are the main connections. Schenker, by the way, has also been linked with the Dunes Hotel in Las Vegas. The national security connections here are the ones that I'm most interested in. Now, those, at, at least past the point, are inextricable with the organized crime connections, but I don't want to get too much into the OC connections per se, because I think that's likely to obscure some of the more important national security connections, although to a certain extent, to distinguish between the two of them is to, destroy an, to draw an academic distinction, because they are inextricably connected. Now, bear in mind here, the main names, main institutional names, Indian Springs State Bank, that fails in part as a result of loans to Global. Now, there may be two Globals, but according to the article here, there, or at least according to a person quoted in the article, they are one and the same. Now, Global, in turn, is connected to race, aviation, and to southern air transport, two airlines both involved in various phases of the Iran-Contra scandal. Southern air transport maintains Global's planes when they were in Miami, and race rented from Global, too, apparently. And in turn, now, according to a couple of different people, Global was basically owned, it was the aviation arm of Eatsco. And the three main people involved here are the aforementioned Farhad Azima, Anthony Russo, and Mario Renda, although Indian Springs State Bank is a bank. Mario Renda apparently involved some of the financial shenanigans that brought them down with some of the SNL scandals that he was involved with, notably mainland savings. 
Actually, it doesn't say here that he was involved with the mainland, uh, that, that the Indian Springs Bank was involved with mainland savings, but uh, Mario Renda, or with mainland savings, rather, Mario Renda was, and Mario Renda is also one of the key players here. Now, of course, the people involved in Itzko are strongly implicated in the Iran-Contra scandal, and there are indications, obviously there's nothing here, that, at least so far, that's likely to get a conviction in court, but there are indications that the operations delineated here to a certain extent, the operations of global international airways, the connected failure of the Indian Springs State Bank, and this tangle of individuals, Messrs. Renda, Russo, and Azima, with their connections to various people, including the Gambino family, uh, also, of course, Adnan Khashoggi, one of the central players in the Iran-Contra scandal. Those indications of possible drug smuggling, possible involvement with uh, aspects of the Iran-Contra scandal, of course, all of that roundly denied by the individuals involved. But certainly, although the, the, as yet we have not got a smoking gun in connection with this particular case, there certainly appear to be enough national security and mainstream right-wing connections, that is to say the, the Republican Party, uh, to warrant a serious investigation. Again, uh, FFT, GFFR, food for thought, grounds for further research. Not anything, at least in this article, which from the information presented in the article is going to get uh, a court conviction in the, in, in the aspects, the various aspects of the Iran-Contra scandal, but certainly a lot of things that would indicate that they are connected to things which might, and I think this, is, this particular article is one of the most important in the Houston Post series. If... The evidentiary, if the evidentiary tributaries set forth here continue to pan out in the direction that they appear to be flowing in, it seems to me we're going to wind up right back at the very core of what uh, on this program we referred to as the Triple Wilson operation and, again, what the, the Christic Institute refers to as the secret team. Very, very important article, uh, article, one of the most important in the series on the CIA and SNL. We're going to take a short musical break now, and I'm going to come back with another very, very important article, which, again, will involve some of the same elements strongly implicated in the Christic suit and the Iran-Contra scandal. And, again, there will not be an absolutely hard connection between the Iran-Contra scandal and related activities and the names and, uh, of individuals and institutions that are going to be set forth here. But, again, there are strong indications that that may be the case. And in the category of FFT, GFFR, we're going to pursue that in, uh, at length and in detail in just a few minutes. We're also going to supplement some of the discussion specifically from the Houston Post on the SNL-CIA connection uh, with some fine information from a great manuscript, a, a characteristically excellent work by Peter Dale Scott, in which he helps to set forth some of the, connect, uh, some of the intersections between the Kerry subcommittee's badly compromised investigation and the Christic Institute's badly frustrated investigation. All of that after a musical break coming up. Well, good evening. Welcome back once again to One Step Beyond. We're going to proceed now with our analysis of the CIA SNL connection, that is to say, apparent connections of the Central Intelligence Agency and people involved with it, to the failure of many of this country's savings and loan institutions that were involved in the recent, or I shouldn't say recent, ongoing SNL scandal. One of the most important articles that was generated in this very important series, being again put out by Pete Bruton of the Houston Post and researched for us once again by that very same listener, one of the most important articles appeared on February 18th of 1990. Now, the, the savings and loan here that we're going to be talking about, the failure of the savings and loan, and again, I'm going to sketch out the major players in this article as well, because like the article that we concluded just a second ago about the Indian Springs State Bank, its connection to global international airways, the connections to race aviation, uh, to SAT, to Southern Air Transport, to Eatsco, to Messrs. Renda, Russo, and Azima. That whole tangle is uh, similar in some ways in terms of the uh, dizzying and uh, somewhat nefarious connections here, uh, connections which are not obviously because of the fact that they were criminal and uh, quite possibly national security related. Those connections have not been fully delineated, and yet there are some very, very tantalizing evidentiary tributaries leading in the direction of the Iran-Contra scandal and many of the people involved in that. So I'm going to sketch out again uh, for mnemonic purposes, for the purposes of memory here, the major players and some of the major names. Now, the, the savings and loan that we're dealing with here is the People's Savings and Loan in Lano, Texas. That's L-L-A-N-O. Now, in turn, the failure of the People's Savings and Loan was due to the fact that a fellow named Ray Corona, C-O-R-O-N-A, 
had borrowed $3 million from Lano in order to prop up his bank, the Sunshine Sunshine Bank of Florida. I believe it's the Sun, Sunshine State Bank. Yes, indeed, the Sunshine State Bank of Florida. Now, the main connection here, again, people's savings and loan. Money le- taken from people's savings and loan was used to prop up the Sunshine State Bank, which is basically controlled by Ray Corona. That, uh, at the time, was being investigated by federal regulators. Eventually, Sunshine went down, and eventually, People's Savings and Loan went down, too, because Ray Corona was not able to get the $3 million back to People's Savings and Loan. Now, the main operation that Ray Corona is connected to that connects to CIA here is the aforementioned Sunshine State Bank. Now, when Sunshine went down, a fellow named Tony Fernandez, a nickname for Antonio Fernandez, a convicted marijuana dealer, a convicted drug smuggler, uh, basically testified. He rolled over. He decided to turn state's evidence. He testified against Ray Corona and his father and stated that in partnership with the Coronas, he had helped start Sunshine State Bank with a large sum of money which were obtained from the profits derived from illegal drug trafficking. Okay, so Tony Fernandez, Antonio Tony Fernandez, former associate and partner, of the Coronas, Ray Corona and his father, they, according to Tony Fernandez, used money from drug smuggling to start the Sunshine State Bank. Now, one of the unindicted co-conspirators in Tony Fernandez operations, part of which were used to start Sunshine, well, one of the the unindicted co-conspirator was a fellow named Frank Castro. We took a look at Frank Castro in a big way in Radio Free America program number 30, the second broadcast in our uh, seven-part Radio Free America series dealing with the Iran-Contra scandal. And Frank Castro is an individual who crops up repeatedly in the history of the U.S. intelligence agencies over the last quarter of a century. In the Peter Dale Scott manuscript that I'm going to be going into, we will touch on uh, Frank Castro past and present. Suffice it to say, he was... Uh, one of the Bay of Pigs veterans involved in organizations like Koru and its many operations. He was also uh, connected to operations, again, through Koru, linked to the assassination of Orlando Letelier. He also has cropped up in a big way in the Kerry Subcommittee's report, as badly compromised as their investigation was. He also is uh, a person who figures very prominently in the milieu being cited in the current and on guard, the current Christic Institute lawsuit as well. Main names connected to Frank Castro are Francisco Paco Chanez, one of the defendants in the Christic suit, and in turn, another one of, another one of the associates of, of Chanez and another defendant in the Christic suit, Moises Nunez, N-U-N-E-Z. We'll get into those individuals later. But uh, it's also worth noting that one of the people involved in the People's Savings and Loan in Llano, Texas, was a longtime organized crime associate of Carlos Marcello named Morris Jaffe. Carlos Marcello, former capo mafioso for New Orleans, or perhaps he still is, I don't know, but he is one of the major organized crime figures involved with the assassination of President Kennedy. There were many organized crime figures involved with the JFK assassination. That should not be interpreted as saying the mafia did it, though. That's uh, uh, a good example of what the intelligence community refers to as a modified limited hangout. There were most assuredly organized crime figures involved and deeply involved, uh, but the fact of the matter is that over the, the main elements involved in assassinating President Kennedy were Nazi and fascist-oriented elements of our own national security establishment going to the very highest levels of the U.S. general staff. However, the elements of the national security establishment we're going to be looking at here, of course, again, People's Savings and Loan, loan to that, loan to the Sunshine State Bank of Ray Corona, helps do in the People's Savings and Loan. The first main figure involved in that loan to Sunshine State is the main person involved in Sunshine State, Ray Corona. Ray Corona's father also involved with him. As it turns out, the Sunshine State Bank was basically a drug front started, according to a Corona partner, Antonio Tony Fernandez, with money from drug trafficking. And, of course, Tony Tony Fernandez, Antonio Fernandez, very much involved with Frank Castro, one of the central players in the national security milieu that crops up in the, in, in the context of the Iran-Contra scandal. So once again, research credit on this to a listener. Reading now from the Houston Post of February 18th of 1990. Again, Pete Bruton again, copyright 1990 by the Houston Post. This is headline, Loan, fr- Loan from Texas Thrift Weaves a Tale of Deceit. And it reads in part as follows. 
A Central Texas savings and loan that had ties to associates of reputed organized crime figures lent $3 million in 1984 to a Miami banker with connections to Central Intelligence Agency operatives, the Houston Post has learned. The transaction, discovered by the Post during an eight-month investigation into the role of fraud in the nation's savings and loan crisis, is one example of how people with ties to organized crime and the CIA have used federally insured financial institutions as a source of money. Evidence found by the Post suggests that some of this money may have been used to pay for covert CIA-sponsored activities, including aid to the Nicaraguan Contras that Congress was unwilling to support publicly. People's Savings and Loan in Lano lent the $3 million to Ray Corona, who in 1987 was convicted of serving as a front man for a major Latin American drug smuggler. The loan from the small SNL in the little Texas town helped Corona keep his Miami bank, Sunshine State Bank, in business while federal regulators were trying to shut it down for making imprudent loans. Federal banking officials refused to release information on whether Sunshine State Bank lent money to any of Corona's CIA associates who were actively assisting the Contras in 1984. Sunshine State Bank was purchased by Corona in 1978 with drug trafficking profits. The land where the bank was located in Miami was used by Corona as collateral for the loan from People's Savings. Corona repaid his People's loan six months after he received it and four months before he was indicted for racketeering. But a $2.3 million loan from Peoples to a Corona associate in Florida was never paid back and helped contribute to Peoples' failure in 1988. Peoples' saving was insolvent at the end of 1986, and by June of 1988, it had a negative worth of $203.6 million. Uh, interrupting, I made a slight error in my introduction. It was not actually the loan from Peoples' savings to the Corona Bank that did in Peoples' savings and loan. That was for $3 million. It was a $2.3 million loan from People's Savings and Loan to a Corona associate in Florida. So I made a slight factual error. That should be corrected. Uh, again, it was a Corona loan, and it was uh, multi-million dollars, but it was not the loan to Corona's bank. It was a loan to an associate in Florida. So I stand corrected on that. Resuming again with that last paragraph... People's saving was insolvent at the end of 1986, and by June of 1988, it had a negative worth of $203.6 million. It was one of four insolvent Texas thrifts sold to Centex at the end of 1988 at a total cost to the federal government of $429 million. At that time, regulators criticized people's lending practices and reliance on brokered deposits for which people's had to pay high interest rates. That last sentence again. It was one of four insolvent Texas thrifts sold to Centex at the end of 1988 at a total cost to the federal government of $429 million. At that time, regulators criticized people's lending practices and reliance on brokered deposits for which people's had to pay high interest rates. About four months before people's savings made the $3 million loan to Corona, the small thrift was purchased by San Antonio businessman Marvin Haas and Waco businessman Jerry Holly, H-O-L-L-E-Y. People's managing officer at the time, Joel Daniel, said Haas and Holly were introduced to Corona by a friend in Miami, Harold White. Harold White, who was on the Sunshine State Bank Board of Directors, is a prominent Miami businessman and son of Armour White, who is said to be a friend of former President Reagan. Haas said that White is the one who introduced them to Corona. Haas said he did not meet Corona until January of 1984, about a month before the loan was made. I think it was only a couple of times I saw him, Haas said. It wasn't even a meeting, it was just a drink. Unquote. Haas declined to answer, uh, Haas declined to answer detailed questions about the Corona loan. Haas also declined to answer questions about his relationship to Harold White. And skipping down further into the article of Harold White, the Reagan administration connected individual who made some of these key introductions for Ray Corona, author Bruton writes as, father, writes as follows. Another people's loan to a Corona associate in Florida was never paid off. This was a $2.3 million loan to Harold White, secured by a second mortgage on some Florida property. The loan was inferior to a first mortgage loan of $6 million from Sunrise Savings, which failed in 1985. Sunrise had an office in Houston and made several loans to Houston lawyer and developer John Riddle, a friend and business associate of Houston developer Robert Corson. Corson, an associate of reputed organized crime figures and an alleged Central Intelligence Agency operative, is under investigation by federal authorities for his role in the failure of several federally insured financial institutions, including Vision Bank Savings in Kingsville, which he owned. 
Riddle, and Corson were involved in buying a majority of the stock of a company traded on the Vancouver Stock Exchange. Corson owned 16% of U.S. Paytel at the time Vision Bank Savings made a loan to a borrower fronting for Riddle in the purchase of 62% of U.S. Paytel, sources told the Post. So uh, before we proceed to the next section of this article, Harold White, son of a Reagan supporter named Armour White, and a friend, of uh, not just a supporter, but a friend of Ronald Reagan, is the fellow to whom the people savings and loan of two point three million dollars was made that was never paid back that was actually the loan and not the loan to corona's sunshine state bank which did in people's state although harold white himself was very much involved with sunshine state bank's board of directors he was on the sunshine state bank board of directors okay so uh... do bear in mind that it was not actually the loan to sunshine state as i indicated that was a factual error It was actually the loan to a director of the Sunshine State of the Sunshine State Bank, I simply had uh, made in my little crib notes here the note uh, Sunshine State loan to Peoples, just by way of quickly detailing some of these connections. Because without uh, the articles in front of you, it's not the easiest thing in the world to keep all of these names straight. It's not all that easy to keep them straight when you do have the article in front of you, as I do. But again, the main things to remember are the relationship between the failure of the failed Peoples Savings and Loan, also the failure of the Sunshine, the Sunshine, or no, Sunrise Bank. Sunshine State is in Florida. The Sunrise Savings Loan and Loan in Houston went down in 1985. That also was connected to Harold White, but it's not directly connected to Ray Corona. And it's the Corona connection here, the Corona connection to People Savings and Loan and in turn to Sunshine State Bank that is really the significant one for our purposes here. Because again, Corona is going to connect up with a fellow named Tony Fernandez, who in turn was connects up with Frank Castro, and when we come into the, to the name Frank Castro, we are off and away on a journey into the netherworld of the Iran-Contra scandal, and that is exactly what we're going to be looking at now. So again, Peoples and Savings and Loan goes down as a result of a loan to a director, not the bank, but a director of the Sunshine State Savings Bank. In turn, people involved with that particular director, Harold White, are also involved in the failure of the Sunrise Savings and Loan in Houston. That's not the Sunshine State Bank in Florida, which is connected to the People's Savings and Loan. This is why I'm only presenting part of these articles, because uh, as confusing as this gets, it gets a whole lot more confusing. And, and again, this is not meant to be clear. The, these things are uh, the visible ends of covert operations, and it's not meant to uh, be as was not, not meant to be absolutely obvious on its surface, and it certainly isn't. Nonetheless, it's pretty fishy, and I don't think you can look at this for terribly long without seeing that not only is there some serious wrongdoing, but obviously this wrongdoing appears to go back to elements of the national security establishment. There is not uh, the, the smoking gun linking this to the Iran-Contra scandal still hasn't come out, but there are so many uh, empty shell casings here and such a smell of cordite in the air that uh, I don't think it's going to be long before that smoking gun turns up. And that smoking gun may turn out to be a machine gun or several thousand by the time uh, the search has been concluded. Continuing now with the Houston Post of February 18th of 1990. People's Savings and Loan also had several connections to associates of organized crime figures. Haas acknowledged being a friend of San Antonio businessman Morris D. Jaffe, who has had long-time ties to New Orleans Mafia boss Carlos Marcello. Federal law enforcement agencies have kept files for more than 20 years on Jaffe's relationship to Marcello. Jaffe did not return calls from the post. Haas, uh, Haas said he once worked for Jaffe. He's been a friend of mine for 29 years, 27 years, 26 years, 20 years, I guess. I don't know, unquote. Haas also said Jaffe was his landlord. Haas had an office at the Central Park Mall in San Antonio that Jaffe owned. Skipping down once again. About six months after the regulator's testimony about Sunshine being a mafia bank, Corona and his father Rafael, who was chairman of the bank, were indicted for racketeering and conspiracy in connection with drug money laundering at Sunshine State Bank. Turning state's evidence against the Coronas, drug dealer Jose Antonio Tony Fernandez testified that the Contras fronted for his purchase of the bank in 1978 with $1.1 million in drug trafficking proceeds. Fernandez, who was accused of smuggling more than 1.5 million pounds of marijuana from Colombia into the United States, pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 50 years in prison. The Corona's first trial ended in a hung jury, but they were convicted after the second trial in 1987. 
Ray Corona received 20 years in jail for racketeering conspiracy and mail fraud. His father got three years in jail, but recently had his conviction reversed by an appeals court. Also in 1986, Ray Corona was convicted of illegally purchasing guns while addicted to cocaine. He had been charged with buying nine guns between October of 1981 and October of 1984 while addicted to cocaine and then lying about it on gun dealers' forms. Thus, when Corona got the $3 million loan from People's Savings and Loan in Lano in February of 1984, he was using cocaine and fronting for one of the biggest Colombia marijuana smugglers in the world. An unindicted co-conspirator in the Fernandez marijuana smuggling syndicate was Frank Castro, a notorious Cuban refugee and Bay of Pigs veteran who headed the Cuban National Liberation Front. In 1983, Castro was arrested by the Drug Enforcement Administration in Beaumont for allegedly smuggling 425,000 pounds of marijuana into Texas. The charges were dropped in June of 1984, the same month he reportedly began training Nicaraguan Contras near Naples, Florida. Castro was indicted along with 12 others in July of 1988 for violating the U.S. Neutrality Act by providing weapons and training to the Contras. Castro and the others said they had the support of the U.S. government in working with the Contras. A federal judge later threw out the charges saying that the U.S. was not technically at peace, quote-unquote, with Nicaragua. Castro was also accused of using drug smuggling and proceeds, uh, reading one more time, beginning again, Castro was also accused of using drug smuggling proceeds to help train Contras in Florida. Quote, Frank Castro is a very dangerous individual. He's CIA trained, unquote, said Assistant U.S. Attorney General Daniel Cassidy, who prosecuted Corona for racketeering in the Sunshine State Bank case. Cassidy said Castro, quote, helped kidnap Tony Fernandez and take him to Colombia, unquote, where Medellin cartel drug dealers wanted to talk to him about drug shipments that had been confiscated by the DEA. Fernandez eventually got out of Colombia, but was later extradited to the U.S. on drug smuggling charges. A staff report by the office of U.S. Senator John Kerry, Democrat of Massachusetts, identified Castro as a business partner and close associate of Frank Chanez, a Miami seafood operator who also provided aid and weapons to the Contras. Chanez was implicated in drug trafficking and laundering of drug money, some of which was reportedly used to assist the Contras. Congressional testimony has linked former White House aide Oliver North to the Contra supply network connected to Castro and Chanez. Several newspapers have reported that the CIA also was linked to the supply network. Skipping down... Castro was providing aid and training to the Contras during the time that the People's Loan to Corona was outstanding. It could not be determined if Castro or any other Contra supporter obtained loans from Sunshine State Bank during this time. The records of the bank were seized by the FDIC, which refused to discuss details of loans made by the bank. Corona also had business ties to Guillermo Hernandez Cartaya, a notorious Cuban exile who has connections to, the, connections to both the mafia and the CIA. At one time, Corona was negotiating to buy a Cartaya bank in Florida. Cartaya was convicted in federal court in 1982 in Texas for fraud involving a thrift he owned in, McMa in McAllen, Jefferson Savings and Loan, despite an appeal by a CIA agent to a Justice Department lawyer that the veteran of the ill-fated Bay of Pigs invasion mm -hmm. not be prosecuted because of his past service to the United States. So again, let me detail this particular connection. And again, we do not have a smoking gun Linking the failure of the Texas, uh, the failures of these savings and loan to the Iran Contra scandal and the activities. But one of the problems is that the information that could provide that link is being withheld. Main names here we're looking at the People's Savings and Loan in Lano, Texas, and in turn operations involving Ray Corona and his Sunshine State Bank in Florida. Now, Ray Corona got a $3 million loan from People's Savings and Loan to, to Sunshine State when it was in trouble. That loan was eventually paid back. However, a $2.3 million loan from People's Savings and Loan to a director of Corona's Sunshine State Bank. This is a fellow named Harold White, son of Reagan associate Armour White. This loan helps bring down People's Savings and Loan. In turn, uh, there are connecting links between Harold White and some of his associates, and the failure of uh, another savings and loan, this, the Sunrise Savings and Loan in Houston. Main names there, a fellow named Frank Corson, mentioned in another one of the articles, but somewhat peripheral to our discussion, and also a fellow named John Riddle. That is an associate of Corson. So it was the Harold White loan, 
he being a director of the bank, not the actual loan to the Sunshine State Bank proper that brings down people's savings and loan. But again, Ray Corona, the main person with Sun- Sunshine State, is also the, one of the main figures linking Sunshine State to people's savings and loan. And it is the Sunshine State Bank that apparently was started with drug smuggling money and was for all practical purposes a front, at least to a certain extent, for drug smuggling. And Antonio Tony Fernandez, the person who started Sunshine State with drug smuggling money, according to testimony he gave in court, one of the unindicted co-conspirators in his operations, Frank Castro. Frank Castro, in turn, works with with Frank Chanez, or uh, Paco Chanez, as he's known, and also a fellow we're going to look at named Rene Corvo in training the Contras. Also, there is a refrigerator. Ref, yeah, I'm going to have to uh, have that in front of me before I can uh, look at it. The Frigoríficos de Puntarenas is the name of their seafood company. This is implicated both in the Kerry Subcommittee report and the Christic Institute's uh, affidavit, the Sheehan affidavit, in drug smuggling on behalf of the Iran Contra, uh, on behalf of the Contra support effort. So we're going to take a look at the details here concerning Frank Castro, Paco Chanes. Frigoríficos de Puntarenas and some of their associates by way of connecting up the milieu we're seeing here in the CIA SNL connection with the milieu that were involved in the Contra support effort, with the milieu involved in the Iran Contra scandal, that milieu to a certain extent identified in the badly compromised Kerry subcommittee report, that milieu also obviously, as we've looked at so many times in the past, particularly in Radio Free America shows 29 through 35, the series on the Iran Contra scandal, as well as miscellaneous shows, that team so very much involved in drug smuggling, terrorism, and all the many activities that uh, both myself and for many, many years before myself, May Brussel, had gone into. Short musical break, and then we're going to come back with an excellent man, or part of an excellent manuscript by Peter Dale Scott that will help detail the activities of some of these individuals and give us an understanding, hopefully, of just the just what exactly underlies the activities of the people we've been looking at and these admittedly tortuous connections between the CIA and the SNLs. Well, good evening. Welcome back once again to One Step Beyond. We're going to proceed now with tonight's archive show detailing the CIA and the SNL connection. Also, a number of other things which, if they don't figure directly in the CIA SNL connection, certainly are connected to the activities of the milieu involved in the CIA and SNL connection and may ultimately be very much involved with the CIA SNL connection per se. Now, recall in that last article that uh, we looked at from the Houston Post, we one of the main connections between the People's Savings and Loan of Lano, Texas, the late People's Savings and Loan of Lano, Texas, because it failed uh, as a result of a $2.3 million loan to Harold White, who was the director of the Sunshine State Bank. Now, Sunshine State was founded by a fellow named Ray Corona, as we learned in the line of the article. The funding to help start Sunshine State Bank came from marijuana deals or drug smuggling deals from a fellow named Antonio Tony Fernandez and one of the unindicted, and we're going to see perhaps why he was unindicted, one of the unindicted co-conspirators of Tony Fernandez was a fellow named Frank Castro. We're now going to take a look at Frank Castro, his documented activity along with Frank Chanez in helping to train the Contras, and the strong indications from documents obtained by the Kerry subcommittee, in which tend to con- which tend to confirm information developed by the Christic Institute, the indications again, we 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 know from well, nobody disputes, including Castro himself, that he was involved in training the Contras with Chanez. Documents obtained by the Kerry subcommittee, as well as information developed by the Christic Institute, would link he and Frank Chanez to drug smuggling on behalf of the Contras as well. And this is the milieu that figures in the failure of many of the uh, CIA and uh, many many of the SNLs, the CIA-connected SNLs. As yet, we can't absolutely link this failure to aspects of the Iran-Contra scandal, but we see the names cropping up all the time. Uh, of course, there are denials of guilt. There are 
uh, assertions of innocent all the way, innocence all the way around. That has tended to be the case with national security investigations in general and the Iran-Contra scandal in particular. In light of all of the information that has not been disclosed, all of the questions that have yet to be answered concerning the possibility of Sunshine State's loans to uh, Messrs. Castro, Chanas, etc., well, there are a lot of hard connections that have yet, uh, a lot of hard questions that have yet to be satisfactorily answered. I suspect that if information ever fully comes out, those questions will be answered and uh, will be answered to the detriment of a lot of very important and powerful people in this country. I suspect that's one of the reasons why the CIA SNL link is not getting the publicity that it deserves.